This video is about life after GP training, making choices in sessional GP work. And it's part of a training session for final year GP registrars, but it focuses particularly on locum working, the challenges, opportunities, practicalities and choices. This topic map highlights all the topics that are covered in that training session, and in particular the ones covered in this video, which are the areas highlighted in blue. So the practicalities of locum work, invoicing, booking, software, terms and conditions, self-employed tax, clinical risk, induction and preparation, and so on, and also the locum options such as freelance, chambers, agency, or working through a web platform. The other parts uh, uh, you can see on this topic plan are available in uh, the other videos of this series. Locum work has, like many things, its upsides and its downsides. So on the upsides, it's known to be uh, the best option for controlling your workload and for determining your weekly hours. It offers flexibility over holidays, not just the timing, but the duration. So it's flexible to fit in long periods of travel or voluntary work overseas. It also allows juggling with other portfolios and with dependents that you may care for and the opportunity to try out different practices. The downsides, however, include isolation, financial insecurity and no sick pay, exposure if there are complaints, particularly to the GMC, complex administration involving tax and superannuation, limited access to education and difficulties accessing NHS net email, higher indemnity, no appraisal funding. Appraisal can be more challenging you're often underrepresented and there's no death underrepresented and there is no death in service benefits so let's look at the nuts and bolts of getting set up as a locum these are the four areas that I'll cover so for tax you want to make sure you record all your income and expenses get an accountant and use some kind of software or platform to keep track of all those numbers and activity from an indemnity point of view, you need to make sure that you, that you inform your medical defence organisation of the types of work and the amount of each kind of work that you'll be doing. You'll need to have a variety of documents ready to present to each of your prospective employers, and this includes your CCT and evidence of inclusion on the medical performers list. also includes proof of indemnity and GMC registration, and your DBS a criminal record check, a proof of identity such as passport and your CV. Finally, some practices also expect to see proof of immunisation, safeguarding and CPR training. From an, an administration point of view, you may want to get some invoicing software that automatically generates invoices and superannuation forms. And you may also uh, want to use a, a variety of different platforms or networks to find work. And this is covered in another slide. Some basic points about getting organised for tax includes keeping of record of your professional income. So this may be your P6C for employed roles and a locum spreadsheet for all your self-employed work and other fee-based work. And then keeping a record of your expenses, which will include professional subscriptions and course fees, mileage equipment, office costs and software, and of course your superannuation contributions for locum work. Some top tips regarding all this are to put money aside regularly right from the outset, use an accountant, consider using some kind of locum software to keep tabs on bookings and invoices, and finally, don't leave your tax return to the last minute. So in terms of finding work, you need to be aware of the different ways in which you can do this. In the North East, there's the North East Sessional GP Group and also Facebook First RCGP uh, page. There are also Federation Locum Banks. Uh, online platforms include Locum Deck and Lantum, and there's also the uh, GP magazines such as Pulse and GP. There are agencies, federations and out of hours organisations, and then there are chambers, which includes Pallant Chamber and the North East Medical Chambers. When you work as a locum, you need to be familiar with uh, the pension form GP Locum A and GP Locum B and we'll explain a bit more about these as we go along. They can be obtained from the Pensions Agency website where all the guidance is also available. If you're working as a locum, you'll need to submit a locum Form B for each of the months in which you work. And attached to that Form B, you'll need to submit a Form A for each of the practices that you've worked in that month. The next slide explains a little bit more about these forms and what you put on them. 
So when you set your locum fee, 90% of that fee is superannuable. That means that your superannuation payment is calculated on the basis of 90% of the fee. And the employee superannuation obviously depends on the tier that you've selected, explained earlier on, on your expected annual income. And the employer superannuation is set uh, for everybody at 14.38%. Your invoice will include not just the fee that you're charging, the practice, but also the employer's portion of the superannuation. Your payment to the NHS uh, Pensions Agency via capita will go uh, will include your employee superannuation part, part and the employer superannuation part and it's recommended that this is done by BACS to NHS England using a reference number which made, is made up of your pension reference number which has eight digits followed by LOC for locum, three letters of the month and then two letters of the year that you're in. It's very important that you use this reference so that it allows your BACS payment to be linked up with the forms A and B. Once you've made the payment it's important to then send the proof of BACS payment, the form B and the form A and email all of those to Capita by the 7th of the month. That's the email address. Capita then submits those payments to the NHS Pendency within 10 weeks. Important tips, are, tips here are to keep email receipts of your emails to Capita and also to remember to request uh, a pensions record annually from the NHS Pensions Agency to make sure that your superannuation is reaching your personal pension record. You will need to have an understanding, even as a locum, about how the pension scheme operates because the likelihood is you will be working in several roles and some of those will fall into practitioner and some into officer income. This is all explained in my other video about life after the VTS. It also covers aspects of making sure that you've paid at the right level and the form you need to complete at the end of each year, which is the Type 2 Practitioner form and explains what a Type 2 Practitioner is. There are now lots of tools that are available to help you keep organised. They start from a basic level through to intermediate and then there are premium packages. At the basic level, packages can create invoice and and invoices and superannuation forms for you and this simplifies this process considerably. At an intermediate level, there may be a cloud space for you to put all your certificates so that the practices can access this by you sharing a link. They may also have an online calendar of availability which may be visible to practices and they may also send invoices and superannuation forms directly to practices. These platforms usually require the payment of a monthly fee and are more costly than the basic package. At the highest level, the uh, software and, and online platforms allow direct booking by practices, but this may cost you a percentage of your fee. Alternatively, it may be a service where the practice pays the fee.
Currently, there are various ways to work as a locum, and the choice between them will depend on what's most important to you, whether it's autonomy, having support for education and appraisal, having peer and admin support, and the professional and financial risk. So the options include working entirely freelance, working through an agency, working through a chambers, or working through some kind of web-based platform. And the next slides will explain a little bit about the different options. There are trade-offs in the choices of working as a locum versus working as a salary doctor. So the highest autonomy and control is often correlated with the lowest degree of financial security and support, and with the highest degree of exposure to complaints particularly GMC complaints. So a salary GP may be working at the end with the most support but the least autonomy, whereas a freelance GP is working at the other end. A Chambers at locum is working somewhere more near the middle insofar as they can decide still what days they work on, how many sessions a week they work, which practices they work in, but they're often working from a predetermined menu of session types from which they can decide what kinds of sessions they want to work. They are also committed to attending Chambers meetings to participate in peer review and education. So let's look at the benefits of working through a Chambers. The benefits for practices include the fact that the Chambers recruitment process provides quality assurance about the locum as they've interviewed the locum and checked their references and so on. The Chambers can provide all the necessary documents that the practice needs, act as a single point of contact for contacting several locums, and may be able to provide a substitute if the locum is ill. In addition, there are often very clear terms of engagement for locums working through Chambers, so less chance of confusion or misunderstandings. And finally, Chambers have a process for handling significant events as part of a peer support and professional development process. And so practices can contact the Chambers to highlight when significant events have occurred. In terms of benefits for locums, there's help with all the administrative side of handling bookings, filling the calendar, invoicing and superannuation forms, having again clear terms and fees which helps the locum and removes that negotiation side of things, um, producing pension forms, provision of education and peer support, help with appraisal audit and SEA, an advocacy role, the Chambers ensures that appropriate induction and logins are provided and also chases late payments um, and cancellation fees. So let's look at the different options for locums in terms of admin support, autonomy, whether it's superannuable and cost to the locum. So if you work freelance, you have no admin support, but complete autonomy, you work a superannuable and there's no additional cost over and above the usual medical defense subscriptions and indemnity. If you work through a web-based platform, there's usually some automation of the paperwork and slightly less autonomy as the T's and C's are often set by the platform. The work is super annual as long as you're paid directly and uh, it's usually free as the fee is charged to practices unless you're working through a platform. So let's compare the different options according to uh, the degree of admin support, autonomy and cost to the locum. So if you work entirely freelance, there's usually no admin support at all, but you have complete autonomy and there's no cost over and above your professional subscriptions, mileage and so on. However, if you work through a web-based platform, there's usually some automation of the admin side, but it's not complete and there's uh, quite a lot of autonomy, but some of your terms and conditions are set by the platform. Um, usually there's a fee uh, that the web platform obtains, but it may be either charged to the practice or to the locum, and that changes significantly the nature of the experience from the locum's point of view. If you work through an agency, again, there's usually some uh, admin support in that the agency may invoice the practice for you and sort out the bookings. Um, and again, you have more autonomy uh, slightly less autonomy than a freelancer because terms and conditions are set by the agency and um, there is uh, usually no cost to the locum, the fee is charged to practices. And then if you work through chambers, there's excellent admin support, both with bookings, paperwork, chasing, invoicing, and superannuation. You have a high level of autonomy, but not as much as a freelancer, as the terms and conditions are set uh, partly by chambers, although you can choose the type of menu, uh, type of session within the menu you, you do. And there's usually a fee to the locum, uh, which is a, a, a percentage of the income from the from the locum fee. 
If we compare these options from the point of view of peer support, education, appraisal and support with GMC complaints, you're the most exposed if you're a freelance working through a web platform or an agency, but you have significant protection and support in those areas if you work through a chambers. You recently asked locums working in the northeast of England whether they agree written terms of conditions of work with practices in advance. And this is aside from agreeing the fee and the workload. And what we found was that about half of locums agree some kind of uh, terms and conditions. So that's uh, those that said often and nearly always, whereas the other half, around 44%, either rarely or never agree any terms and conditions. So why should you define your workload as a GP locum? Well, there are a couple of groups of reasons, one clinical and one professional. Under the clinical the GMC states that you should work within the limits of your competence and I think that means not just your skill set but the limits of your ability to handle different amounts of workload. Secondly, working within defined limits of workload is likely to be associated with less errors, complaints and litigation. And thirdly, working in an unfamiliar environment places particular challenges on timekeeping and on uh, running to time. From a professional point of view, you want to be clear what you're going to deliver so that there are no surprises either for you or for the practice. Secondly, you want to be sure that you arrive on time at your afternoon surgery if that's different to the morning or that you arrive on time at any later commitment you may have. And finally, you need to remember that you're self-employed and this means that you decide what, how, where and when you do the work that you do and this is explored further in the next slide. So to explore this issue between self-employed and employed a bit further, a self-employed person decides what work they do and when, where or how to do it. They're not under direct supervision. In contrast, an employed person has a manager or supervisor who's responsible for their workload, saying when a piece of work should be finished and how it should be done. And it's important to remember that there are advantages to the practice as well as the locum in the fact that the GP locum is self-employed. So let's look at how you might define your work as a GP locum to be safe. I think it's useful to think of this in terms of core plus extras using this traffic light diagram with the green bit being the core bit which is included in your standard fee and this includes things like a set number of appointments and visits, your own prescriptions and your own investigations and referral letters arising from this caseload. The amber zone is your maybe zone. These are discretionary items of work which you may do depending on the surgery or depending on circumstances and may be subject to an extra fee. And this might include extras, repeat prescriptions, on call, telephone, triage and visits. The red zone is what you might call your never zone. And this might include things like handling letters and results of others, doing private work and supervision of registrars, nurses and nurse practitioners. But the division between these three areas is entirely personal. The principle is that as you move from your core work to what you consider discretionary, you might charge an additional fee and it might be subject to your agreement on the day, depending on time. There are often things for which it's difficult to estimate the time. So when setting your terms of service, you want to specify your fees according to the session type. And usually sessions are defined by workload, not just duration. You may want to specify fees for extras, such as extra appointments, visits or on-call duties. And also an hourly rate for overrunning, for example, if the computer is down or there's delay in providing you with logins. Additionally, you may want to specify what kind of administration you'll be doing, whether you'll be doing only your own letters and lab results or whether you'll be doing those of others. You'll need to specify whether you'll be doing repeat prescriptions, your cancellation terms, so the fee that you'll charge if the practice no longer needs you and cancels your session at short notice, what kind of appointments uh, you want to be booked as double appointments, for example, if you need interpreters. You want to specify the induction information that you'd like to be provided with and the logins you want to be provided with, for example, for clinical systems and test requesting systems. There are a number of examples of terms and conditions available on the web, uh, on the web including the National Association of Sessional GPs and also the Northeast Sessional GP Group website. 
For longer term locums, there are some additional things you need to think about. For example, over a six month period, you may well take some holiday. So it's worth agreeing in advance how much holiday you intend to take. As a self-employed contractor, it's up to you when you take it, but it is helpful to agree how much notice you'll provide for the holiday. You may want to specify well you, whether you'll be participating on the on-call rotor, and if so, uh, with what frequency and how much you'll charge when you're on call. You may want to uh, ask to have access to practice meetings to be part of the team, to have a regular room, and you may also want to negotiate some additional time for administration as there's likely to be more paperwork involved. And so in some cases, you may want to reduce your overall number of appointments offered to allow more time for paperwork. You need to remember that if you're doing a longer term locum for more than six months, this is type two practitioner work and has uh, an effect on your superannuation paperwork. The signing of repeat prescriptions can be an area for misunderstanding between locums and practices. We surveyed locums in the northeast to ask them about their custom and practice and found that there was a difference between short and long term placements. Uh, insofar as those working in short term placements were much less likely to, to sign repeat prescriptions than those working in longer term placements where they could be familiar with the safety of practice systems and the medication review systems. This is in keeping with guidance from the medical defence organisations. There are certain things that are worth considering when you're taking a uh, on locum work in places that you don't know. So for example, you want to be very careful that you don't cancel locums or double book yourself as reliability is very important to your reputation and your professionalism as a locum. It's also important not to have unclear terms because these can lead to misunderstandings. For some locums, it may be better to avoid single-handed practices as you will be left with providing all the prescriptions, doing all the on-call and occasionally being involved in reciprocal arrangements with other single-handed practices and covering more than one practice. There is often no support from another clinician. You want to avoid working in a practice where you're unfamiliar with the IT systems and also perhaps avoiding practices that have a poor reputation uh, either because the, their doctors are under investigation by the GMC or they've had a poor CQC rating. Remember that you're very exposed as a locum so working in a practice with poor systems increases your exposure even more. Things that were highlighted when we surveyed some of the locums in the northeast were that they tended to avoid practices with very demanding patients or unfriendly practices where the on-call was expected. They also tended to avoid practices where there was no proper dictation equipment where you had to type your own letters or you had to do your own choose and book uh, administration. They also reported avoiding practices where there were referral management systems where you had to discuss all your refer referrals. Finally, there were some that commented that they avoided surgeries that were entirely telephone triage based. So this slide illustrates how you can how you set your locum fee on a work based on a worked example um, using the NASGP and BMA fee calculator. So if we pick uh, a uh, arbitrary annual income that you feel that you're personally worth and equate that to nine sessions per week, you need to add on uh, a percentage for expenses that you think you'll incur, and that will include things like GMC, medical indemnity, travel, and so on. And then working out your daily sessional fee rate will depend on a number of factors. So for example, if you say you're going to take six weeks annual leave and bank holidays, the calculation will be different than if you're going to also build in some time for continuing professional development, for example, two weeks, as of course you still need to meet the requirements of appraisal in, in your time and there's no provision to claim an appraisal fee. So that needs to be reflected. The time spent on CPD and appraisal needs to be reflected in your fee. You may decide that you want to reflect the same amount of CPD that a salary GP would be entitled to or one session per week, in which case the calculation will be different again. So it's possible to use a fee calculator to work out what your sessional fee would be in all of these situations. But remember that you'll always need to include on top of that the employer's superannuation. If you start off, off at a different starting annual income that you think you're worth, then of course you're going to arrive at different sessional rates again. One thing that we're asked a lot by GPs working as locums is when does a long-term locum make you an employee?
And this is quite a complex area and it's worth referring to guidance on both the BMA website and the NASGP website. But there are three angles on this. One is the point of view of HMRC or the tax angle. The second one is the angle of your employment rights, for example, the right to sick leave, paid annual leave and so on. And the third is the pensions or superannuation angle. From a tax point of view, there are uh, there's plenty of, evidence, uh, uh, of uh, guidance on the HMRC website that you're self-employed if you can make a profit or a loss, you have a con contract for services, take unpaid leave, you set your own fees and invoice for work, you decide how much, when and how to work, you might work for multiple businesses and uh, you provide your own equipment and have the right of substitution. From an employment rights point of view, Usually being employed means that you've got the right to statutory pay, such as sick and maternity pay. There's a notice period, there's the rights against rights to unfair dismissal um, and also redundancy payment and the right to flexible working. The pension angle is that if you're working for more than six months in a post, um, you become a type 2 practitioner and you can't use law, locum form A and B. You have to use a solo form and 100% of the fee is superannuable, superannuation being deducted by the practice. However, the other option is that you uh, work using a form A and B, but you don't pension the seventh month uh, of the work in that practice. The issue of employment status comes up a lot amongst locums, particularly doing long-term work. And so I thought I would just summarise here some key points from the website of the Inland Revenue. You can pause the video if you want to read these. I also wanted to highlight a recent review called the, uh, the Taylor Review, uh, titled Good Work, which highlights some of the issues that have been in the press a lot around exploitation of freelance workers and the need for de better protections for these workers. We surveyed locums in the northeast of England to ask them about the factors which influenced their choice of practice. And we found that by far the most important was the fact that practice respects the workload they've agreed to do. And given that people choose to do locum work in order to have control over workload, that makes sense. Other factors that determined their preference of, for practice are listed here and you can see their uh, order of priority. It's really important when you start out as a locum to make sure that you're prepared and organised. And this um, t can be looked at in three steps. So what you need to do at booking, on arrival and on leaving. So at booking, you're looking at confirming your workload and fee, making sure that you request a personal login, uh, informing the practice about your smart card, asking to have access to the test requesting system or ICE, and just clarifying whether there's any help with choose and book or whether you're required to do those yourself. You also ask about a locum induction file and parking. Make sure you provide all the documents a practice needs and you might want to ask whether there's dictation support. When you arrive, you want to make sure you get your logins, get access to all the telephone numbers, find out who's on call, how to obtain a chaperone, how the dictation works, where all the referral forms and, uh, are in the secretary, where emergency drugs are and defibrillator and who to give your superannuation forms and your invoice to. And then on leaving, making sure that you cover handovers, finish any referrals, sort out superannuation form and invoices and uh, are clear between you and the practice about handling any feedback or complaints. When you work as a locum, you, locum induction is really important and this includes uh, the domains of um, induction to the room, the practice team, the building and the community and hospital and also IT. So from this point of view, it's making sure that you've uh, informed them about your smart card and they've got it registered to the practice, that you've got a login to the computer clinical system and also to the testing system. You may want to log into the intranet system where all the guidelines and referral forms are and you may need a login to the digital dictation system. The other important domains of practice induction include the room, so making sure it's fully stocked and you've got the telephone list, you know where the panic button is, the dictaphone, how to call patients in and you know where to find everything. In terms of the practice teams, knowing how to request common things, what the nurses around you are prepared to do, the chaperone and on-call system, how to message doctors, where to access secretarial and admin support, how to report significant events and how repeat prescribing systems work. And this should all be in the induction folder. The community and hospital side of things includes knowing about referral guidelines, 
and local services, safeguarding and palliative care, ambulatory care and admission avoidance options, and the CCG intranet. And finally, orientation to the building is about knowing where the defibrillator and drugs are, fire exits, toilets, um, whether you need a swipe card, when the building's closed, and any uh, restrictions on parking. One of the things it's important to appreciate is that when you decide to work in a particular setting, you may be narrowing your skill set. So if we look first at general practice, the green column in the middle, when you're working in a traditional practice, you're using a range of skills like chronic disease, acute uh, general practice, visits, palliative care, contraception, telephone triage. Looking to the left, left at locums, you will probably get less experience of chronic disease, palliative care and telephone triage. If you go to a walk-in centre, you might get a lot less exposure to chronic disease and uh, indeed no exposure to visits, no exposure to palliative care and very limited exposure to contraception and there, there won't be any telephone triage. Looking towards the right, working in a hub, uh, which is part of extended abs ac access again, there's no chronic disease, uh, no visits, no palliative care and uh, usually no telephone triage. And then in the out of hours setting, uh, again, there's less chronic disease, but you may have some palliative care and you certainly uh, can do visits. So it's important to realise that when you choose one of these settings, you may de-skill in certain areas. I hope you found this video useful. Please remember it's part of a series of videos uh, that I've created for newly qualified GPs. And uh, the other videos in this series cover salaried options. And also there's a generic video about a range of issues like indemnity, support, um, superannuation and so on. Do get in touch if you have feedback you'd like to share and please feel free to share this video with your colleagues.